On a dark, moonless night, a misty light reaches up across the sparkling vault of the heavens. At first, it looks like a cloud or a puff of smoke that could blow away on a stiff breeze, but it holds to its place among the stars. Because this is something more permanent and more intriguing than a passing cloud. This is what the Romans once called the Via Lactea, the Milky Way. And for astronomers through the ages, it has proved to be a pathway to discovery. To ancient sky watchers, the Milky Way was a mystery that became a myth. Some saw it as the wake of a celestial ship, others as the seam where the two halves of the sky were stitched together. But these stories and legends say more about the people who told them than they do about the true nature of the Milky Way. To the ancient Greeks, the Milky Way was formed when the goddess Hera awoke to find a strange infant, the baby Hercules, suckling at her breast. The divine milk bestowed immortality, but when Hera realized she'd been tricked, she pushed the babe away, and the spurting milk sprayed across the sky. Today, our word galaxy comes from the Greek word for milk. But stories aside, the Milky Way's true nature was hidden until people could see it through a telescope. It was 1609 when Galileo first turned the new invention toward the Milky Way's misty light and recorded what he saw. Galileo had discovered that the Milky Way is made up of countless stars, stars that are too far and too faint to see individually. Yet together, they paint the sky with a luminous glow. It was a realization that changed everything because it gave depth to the night sky. And it meant astronomers were free to explore a heavenly realm that the ancients had never dreamed of. Galileo noticed that the stars in the Milky Way are sometimes grouped in clusters. And as telescopes improved, astronomers discovered something else. Clouds of glowing gases called nebulae that would later prove to be the birthplaces of stars. many of them located along the Milky Way, like gems on a cosmic necklace. But even as the telescope uncovered the hidden treasures nestled within the Milky Way, it left a big question unanswered. Why is the Milky Way confined to a narrow band that wraps around the sky? It would take another century and a half after Galileo before someone had the beginnings of an answer. In 1785, William Herschel, a German-born musician and astronomer working in England, was already famous for his discovery of Uranus. It was the first planet in the solar system to be spotted with a telescope. Now Herschel was ready to turn his attention to the placement of the stars around the sky, including the Milky Way. His strategy was straightforward but painstaking. Pointing his telescope at over 600 different locations, Herschel proceeded to count all the stars he saw in each region, and he estimated the relative brightness of each star. 
Herschel guessed that fainter stars were further away than brighter stars. So when he put it all together, he came up with a picture of the universe that looked like this. It shows that we are embedded in a vast system of stars that has a flattened shape, like a giant millstone or a disk. In some directions, the stars are relatively few in number, but along the mid-plane of the disk, the stars become more numerous, their light adding up to form the glowing band of the Milky Way. Herschel's map was a huge step forward, but it was also just the tip of the cosmic iceberg. For beyond the limits of Herschel's telescope, a far grander Milky Way was still waiting to be discovered. By building on the work of William Herschel, astronomers in the 19th century had verified that our solar system is located within a galaxy of stars, shaped like a giant disk. This explains why the Milky Way appears to us as a glowing band of light stretching across the sky. When we look along the band, we're looking into the disk. But astronomers were not entirely satisfied with this early picture of our galaxy. For one thing, it meant the solar system had to be located near the center of the Milky Way, an unlikely coincidence. And without a way to measure the true distances to the stars, there was no way of knowing how accurate this picture of the galaxy might be. To get a deeper understanding of the Milky Way, astronomers needed new tools and new ideas. By 1912, they had both. The new idea was a way to directly measure distance in deep space, and its discovery was entirely unexpected. In the era before electronics, Henrietta Leavitt was one of several women employed by the Harvard College Observatory to do mathematical calculations. At that time, large amounts of data were flooding into the observatory, thanks to the development of astronomical photography. The female computers who worked at Harvard were not expected to make scientific discoveries of their own. But that is precisely what happened when Levitt noticed a pattern in a certain type of variable star called the Cepheid variable. Levitt saw that each Cepheid pulsed with a regular cycle and that the length of the cycle was related to the total amount of light coming from the star. Simply by timing the pulsations of a Cepheid variable, astronomers could now calculate the star's true brightness and then work out its distance by comparing that to how bright it appeared in the sky. The method was quickly put to use with the help of astronomy's most powerful telescope of the time, the 60-inch reflector high atop Mount Wilson near Los Angeles. Backed by the telescope's unprecedented power, Harlow Shapley, a crime reporter turned professional astronomer, would make galactic history. Shapley used the giant scope to examine globular clusters, distant concentrations of stars with a distinctly spherical shape. Each globular cluster contains hundreds of thousands or even millions of stars, circling around one another like bees in a swarm. Shapley believed that these clusters, in turn, must circle around the gravitational center of the Milky Way. By using Cepheid variables to measure the distances to the clusters, Shapley was able to work out the location of a point in space 
around which all the clusters appear to be concentrated. The result changed everything. It showed that the real center of the Milky Way is located tens of thousands of light years away from us, in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. For astronomers, the revelation was a cosmic wake-up call. Centuries earlier, it was Nicholas Copernicus who had nudged Earth out of the center of the solar system and put the sun there instead. Now it was Shapley's turn to push the solar system away from the center of the Milky Way. Shapley's discovery relegated us to the suburbs of a galaxy that is much larger than anyone had previously imagined. Today, astronomers estimate the Milky Way is more than 100,000 light years across. Yet even in Shapley's time, there was growing evidence that this vastly expanded Milky Way was only a small piece of a far grander cosmic reality. That evidence came in the form of a class of faint, fuzzy objects scattered around the sky that were coming into focus as telescopes improved. Many looked like little spindles. Others had a distinctly spiral shape. To some, it seemed that these faint swirls must be newborn solar systems forming within the Milky Way. But there was also a more radical possibility. Could they instead be other galaxies, like the Milky Way, but located far off in the cosmic distance? In the early 1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble was able to prove that the answer was yes. Using the newly built 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, Hubble zoomed in on the largest of the mysterious spirals, the Great Nebula in Andromeda. There, he spotted Cepheid variables, the pulsating stars that would again prove crucial. This time, they allowed Hubble to calculate the true distance to Andromeda. The results would become a turning point in our understanding of the cosmos. Hubble's measurement showed that Andromeda must be a separate galaxy, far beyond the borders of the Milky Way. Today, astronomers have pegged its distance at more than two million light years away. Other galaxies are millions, even billions of light years farther. Hubble had discovered the rest of the universe. But he had also given astronomers a new way to think about the Milky Way by comparing it to other galaxies. The era of galactic exploration was about to begin. By the mid-1920s, astronomers had realized that the universe is full of galaxies. Like islands in a cosmic sea, the galaxies are separate systems, each containing hundreds of billions of stars. But this revelation raised many new questions about our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Was it a spiral system, like some of the others, that could be seen from afar? And if so, how would we know? It had taken centuries for astronomers to figure out that the Milky Way is shaped like a large disk, with the solar system located about two-thirds of the way from the center. Now the challenge was to map the Milky Way from the inside. This was no easy feat, and a big part of the problem is dust. Even ancient astronomers could see the Milky Way does not have a uniform appearance across the sky. Instead, it looks patchy and uneven, 
In some places, it seems split by dark rifts. This is because the Milky Way is interwoven with vast clouds of interstellar dust that block much of the galaxy from our view. Yet despite this visual barrier, there are clues that helped astronomers discern our galaxy's true shape. Among the first to follow those clues was American astronomer William Morgan. In 1951, Morgan was working at the Yerkes Observatory northwest of Chicago, where he was studying blue supergiant stars, the hottest, brightest stars in the galaxy. One night, while looking in the direction of the constellation Perseus, Morgan realized that a number of the giant stars he had been studying in that part of the sky were all located at about the same distance, between five and 8,000 light years away. And so too is the Perseus double star cluster, a well-known feature in the same part of the sky. Morgan realized that the double cluster and the giant stars together traced a line through space, as though marking a structure embedded within the Milky Way. He had discovered the Perseus Arm, one of the great spiral arms of our galaxy. Before long, other familiar sites scattered along the Milky Way were also shown to be part of the Perseus Arm. Among them is the spectacular Crab Nebula, the remnant of a supernova explosion that was recorded in 1054. But if there was one spiral arm, there should also be others. By looking in the opposite direction from Perseus, astronomers found they could see traces of another arm that is located closer to the center of the galaxy. This is the Sagittarius arm, home to a dazzling array of star clusters and nebulae that adorn the southern Milky Way. Spectacular sights, like the Trifid Nebula, make this part of the sky a visual paradise. Closer to home, astronomers have determined that our own solar system is part of the Orion Arm, a smaller structure that may be no more than a spur branching off of Sagittarius. Yet the Orion Arm, too, is loaded with amazing sights, which loom large in our view because they are relatively close by. It is when we look down the length of the Orion Arm that we see the nearest, and to us, the most spectacular star-forming region in the sky. The Great Nebula in Orion, where thousands of new stars are being born before our eyes. Aided by radio telescopes and infrared satellites that can see through the galaxy's obscuring dust, astronomers have now peered deeply into the Milky Way to map its structure in detail. They have detected more arms and also confirmed that the Milky Way is not just a spiral galaxy, but a barred spiral. Barred spiral galaxies are common in the universe. Their elegant appearance is the product of an evolutionary process that causes material within the galaxy to form a horizontal bar running across the center. Now, more than 60 years after Morgan's initial discovery of the Perseus arm, astronomers can show us what the Milky Way might look like if we could view it from the outside. This is the result an artist's view that shows our galaxy as a barred spiral with two prominent arms. One of them is the Perseus arm, the first to be mapped. On the opposite side is the Scutum Centaurus arm. It's much harder to make out from Earth, but astronomers have found that it hosts massive clusters of hot young stars, like this one, imaged in infrared light by the Spitzer Space Telescope. Completing the view 
are the lesser spiral arms that wind their way between the two larger ones, including the arm where our own solar system is located, right here. This is a view that no telescope can show us, but one that is supported by years of observation across the entire Milky Way. The mapping of our galaxy is one of astronomy's great achievements, but it's more than just a map, it's a snapshot of a dynamic star system with a history that has unfolded over billions of years. A history that relates directly to our own existence. In that sense, the spiral may be the ultimate cosmic symbol of life. For it's in spiral galaxies that new stars and new planets are born. It's the same process that led to our own solar system's creation in the Milky Way. In that sense, the spiral may be the ultimate cosmic symbol of life. For it's in spiral galaxies that new stars and new planets are born. And sometimes, civilizations like ours, with a desire to map and to explore the universe around them. In all of human experience, there are few sights as inspiring as a dark sky full of stars. Throughout history, our nightly view of the universe has fueled our collective imagination. It has helped give birth to great art and deep insights. But when it comes to the birth of the universe, not even the most creative work of imagination can rival the story that science has now revealed. It's a story that starts with a bang. Welcome to the Big Bang, the energetic outburst at the start of cosmic history that triggered the expansion of space and the creation of all matter. This is our ultimate beginning. The discovery that there was such a beginning is one of the signature triumphs of 20th century science. Now, the challenge to understand it is underway. Every great civilization in history has its creation story, the explanation that answers the question, how did all of this get here? In some ways, the Big Bang Theory has a lot in common with those stories, because like them, it conjures up a vision of supreme forces and astonishing events beyond human experience. The difference is that the Big Bang story is backed up by evidence, evidence that we can find all around us if we know how to look. This is Europe's Planck satellite. Launched in 2009, it's an orbiting time traveler that has reached back across more than 13 and a half billion years to bring us to the threshold of the Big Bang. 
Planck has given us the most comprehensive view to date of a crucial turning point when light was first able to move freely through space and carry with it information about how the universe began. To achieve this view, Planck has probed deep into space in every direction, creating a map of the entire sky. But what that map shows is not a familiar scene of stars and galaxies. Rather, it's the faint signal that emanates from the darkness beyond, the cosmic background that lies behind everything else. This is a direct view of the universe when it was only 380,000 years old, just a tiny fraction of its current age. On the face of it, such a view might well seem impossible because it suggests that we can witness something that took place before Earth even existed. But in fact, we can, thanks to the finite speed of light. Light is the fastest thing we know in nature. It travels through space at nearly 300,000 kilometers per second. At that speed, the light we see from the moon takes just 1.3 seconds to reach Earth. That's incredibly fast, but it still means that when we look up at the moon, we are looking into the past, a past that took place on the lunar surface 1.3 seconds ago. The planet Saturn is much farther than the moon, so its light takes longer to reach us. When we gaze at Saturn's rings through a telescope, we are also gazing more than one hour back in time. Looking beyond our solar system, the difference between past and present becomes truly dramatic. Here are the Pleiades, a brilliant cluster of stars located some 400 light years away. That means when we see the Pleiades, we see them not as they are now, but as they once were, 400 years ago, around the time Galileo was recording his first view of the Pleiades through a telescope. But our ability to time travel becomes truly impressive once we peer beyond the boundaries of our own Milky Way galaxy. Here is the Andromeda galaxy, the most distant object visible to the naked eye. It lies more than two and a half million light years away, so our view of Andromeda actually shows what this galaxy looked like two and a half million years ago. That's long before the first Homo sapiens walked on Earth. Such a span of time is incomprehensible on a human scale. On a cosmic scale, it's a short step. Probing deeper into space with powerful telescopes, we see countless galaxies that are tens or hundreds of millions of light years away. Today, as we push to the farthest extremes of visibility, we can just make out the light from galaxies that are 12 billion light years away. Seeing them means we can see more than 90% of the way back to the Big Bang. Beyond this point, there are no more galaxies to observe, because at such a remote and early time, galaxies hadn't formed yet. but we can still look farther to a time when light came not from stars or galaxies, but from the glowing fog of hot gas that filled the universe in the aftermath of the Big Bang. This is where the Planck satellite has taken us. And it's here that we can find the clues that will lead us to a deeper understanding 
of the Big Bang. Thirteen and a half billion years ago, our universe looked very different than it does today. This is a time just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, when space was filled with particles still too energetic to form atoms. Today, that early stage in cosmic history is imprinted in the heavens, revealed in this detailed map from the Planck satellite. To the eye, the map seems to lack an apparent pattern. But when analyzed mathematically, these colored speckles provide a detailed measurement of the basic properties of the universe and a window onto the Big Bang itself. The key to understanding the map is to realize that it's a record of temperature. It's showing us a universe in the process of cooling down from its white hot infancy. Red represents distant regions of space that were slightly warmer than average in the remote past, while blue is for those regions that were slightly colder. These differences are like cosmic seeds that allowed matter to accumulate in some pockets of space while leaving others mostly empty. Today, the vast clusters of galaxies we see all around us are the byproducts of this primordial clumping of matter. But if Planck can look back to a time when all of space was filled with a white hot gas, then why doesn't the sky look white now? The answer to that question challenges one of our deepest intuitions about the universe the idea that it's always been here. In ancient times, looking into the heavens was like coming face to face with eternity. Perhaps that's because here on Earth, time brings growth and decay. While up above, the stars appear timeless. Aristotle, the most influential of the ancient thinkers, thought he had proved the universe was eternal. For him, the notion that there could be nothing before there was something offended reason itself. But when Isaac Newton discovered his law of gravity, a problem with eternity soon emerged. Because of gravity, the stars must all be attracted to one another. Yet if the universe is eternal, why haven't the stars already converged in one place? That question lingered uncomfortably for more than two centuries, right up to the 1920s. By then, there was a new theory of gravity, thanks to Albert Einstein. And astronomers had realized that stars are grouped into galaxies and that galaxies are scattered through space. But the problem of eternity remained. Over an endless span of time, gravity should have drawn all the galaxies together. To avoid this contradiction, Einstein changed his equations in a way that would exactly counterbalance the influence of gravity across space. But Einstein soon found out that he needn't have bothered. In 1929, following up on earlier work by other astronomers, Edwin Hubble announced that most of the galaxies are moving away from our own. He discovered this by spreading out the light of each galaxy into a spectrum 
like a rainbow. Anything that is moving away will appear to emit light that is shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. That's exactly what Hubble saw, and the farther away a galaxy was located, the faster it seemed to be retreating. For Hubble, and for scientists since then, the most logical explanation is that space itself is expanding and pulling the galaxies along with it. On a human scale, the expansion of the universe is happening too slowly for us to notice. It amounts to every meter of space growing by just the diameter of a single atom every 10 years. That's not enough to overcome the gravity that holds stars together. So the Milky Way isn't getting any bigger, and neither are we. But in the great void between the galaxies, the expansion of space is adding up. And it means that overall, the galaxies are quickly flying apart. It also means that if we journey back in time, then the galaxies we observe today were once much closer together than they are now. And at some point in the past, there would have been no distinct stars or galaxies at all, just a continuous blaze of hot matter. This is the universe as seen by the Planck satellite. But today, space has expanded so much that the light from this early period has been redshifted beyond the range of the human eye, past the infrared, to ultimately become a signal in the microwave part of the spectrum. That signal was discovered by accident in 1964, when Robert Wilson and Arno Penzias Two radio astronomers from Bell Labs turned an antenna toward the heavens and couldn't understand why the entire sky was giving off microwaves. Without realizing it, they had discovered the cosmic background, proof that the universe as we know it is not eternal, but had a definite beginning in time. A big bang. But there was more to come. As the space age blossomed, so too did the realization that this message from the distant past held the key to our cosmic origins. The big bang theory tells us the universe that we see today was born out of a white-hot mixture of particles that would eventually cool down to make atoms, stars, and galaxies. But because the universe is expanding, that brilliant beginning has faded from view. Luckily, it can still be found in the form of a cosmic background of microwave energy coming from every direction in space. And space is the best place to see it. In 1989, NASA launched COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer. Its mission was not just to detect the cosmic background, but to see whether it might reveal important details about how the universe evolved. The task was not an easy one. Previous studies with high-altitude aircraft had already shown that the cosmic background is remarkably uniform across the sky. Yet somehow, that uniform glow from the distant past had given way to the very diverse universe we live in now a universe containing great congregations of galaxies, surrounded by enormous voids of empty space. So, as Kobe began to map the entire cosmic background, 
Scientists searched for subtle differences hidden in the smoothness of the ancient universe. What they discovered was a remarkable confirmation of the Big Bang. In this Kobe image, the cosmic background appears blotchy, showing very slight differences in temperature on the order of one hundred thousandth of a degree. Scientists were ecstatic. Although these variations were minuscule, they meant that Kobe was seeing the earliest hints of large-scale structure in the universe. It also meant that the cosmic background could serve as a link to an even more distant past. Scientists realized the blotches were the traces of momentary fluctuations in energy that occurred when the universe was just a fraction of a second old. But as space rapidly expanded, those tiny fluctuations were stretched to giant size, eventually leaving their mark on the cosmic microwave background. Kobe had revealed the power of the cosmic background as a window into the Big Bang. Now scientists were eager to learn more. Following the success of Kobe, NASA began work on the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, WMAP for short, which was launched in June of 2001. Like Kobe, WMAP was designed to image the entire cosmic background, but it would do so in much greater detail. The stunning result would put to the test theories about how the Big Bang unfolded. For one thing, WMAP confirmed that much of the mass of the universe is in the form of invisible dark matter, consisting of undiscovered particles that are heavier than those that make up stars and galaxies. WMAP brought us a huge step closer toward understanding the Big Bang but the Planck mission would go even further. Planck was built to survey the cosmic background at more wavelengths and at even higher precision than WMAP. After more than 15 months of scanning, scientists began carefully peeling back the layers in Planck's ultra-sensitive view. First, sources of microwaves that are close by in space had to be subtracted from the image. Next, scientists stripped away all the energy coming from distant sources within the plane of the Milky Way and from the wispy dust clouds that are pervasive throughout our galaxy. Finally, what remained was the cosmic background itself, seen as never before. The result was a triumph. When it was released in March of 2013, it was clear the new map offered a remarkable portrait of the universe in hard numbers. Among those numbers is the precise age of the universe, which Planck measures at 13.819 billion years old. Planck also provided a detailed breakdown of how the contents of the universe are divided between ordinary matter, including stars and galaxies, dark matter, which gives off no light but accounts for most of the mass in the universe, and a third ingredient called dark energy, which is causing the expansion of space to speed up over time. Such numbers are crucial because they can help cosmologists distinguish between different variants of the Big Bang Theory. Today, the dominant idea about how the universe came to be is called inflation. It proposes that in the first trillionth, trillionth, trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, the universe expanded exponentially, driven by a release of energy from the vacuum of space. 
Among other things, inflation explains why the universe looks so similar across great distances in every direction. Scientists working with Planck say that it rules out some versions of inflation, but is consistent with others. However, there are also alternative ideas, including some that say the universe we know today is part of a repeating cosmic cycle. If so, there may have been other universes before this one. To help distinguish between these possibilities, scientists are now searching for signs that gravitational waves produced by the Big Bang left their mark on the cosmic background. Meanwhile, perhaps the most important result from the Planck mission is that across many scales, the cosmic background looks mathematically simple. This in itself may be telling us something deeply profound about the cosmos, a universe that began with a bang, but that has evolved into a symphony of forms and phenomena. A universe that may have started simple, but that has become a truly inspiring place. Thank you.